Good morning, one and all. Most of you know who I am. If you don't, my name's Alistair. Ian and Mandy are away, away for a holiday with their family and various others, well, certainly with their family. So later on, we will certainly pray, uh, pray for them. So welcome to Quorn Baptist Church, whether you're here or whether you are joining us online or catching up later. A few things uh, to say. Um, First of all, here, there is a very nice uh, earring, which doesn't, unfortunately, suit me. It would suit me because the color is about the same color as my shirt, but I don't actually wear earrings. And it is a planet, and the planet is Saturn. Saturn. Thank you. Okay. Has anybody lost an earring? It was found a week or so ago. Okay. Well, that's fine. I shall uh, let people know. I'll put it in my pocket, and it will probably come out in the wash. Um, uh, Ian, as I say, is away. He apologises. Um, uh, most of the uh, notices are in the sheet as normal, but he apologises. He didn't remember to put uh, a notice in about uh, a group that meets together tomorrow at 11.45. Uh, and it's a group that prays for Israel and the Holy Land. And all are welcome. Um, uh, can I see? Yes, I can see Jill there. Um, if you want to know more about that, then speak to Jill, please, about that. Yeah, meeting here rather than online, yes? yes? That's the point. It's meeting here. You didn't hear me say that. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to have people keeping you on, in, in line, isn't it? It really is. Okay. And we'd also like to, to welcome uh, David and Jan. Um, uh, they worship at uh, Hol Hollywell uh, Church. We've known them for many years. A number of people here do as well. And David will be uh, bringing God's word to us later on. Um, there'll be a few other things that we'll pray for when we have time for prayer uh, uh, later as well. Um, however, we normally do tell you what's happening in the building, not at great length, but things are happening um, with the building. You'll have seen the scaffold if you haven't been around for a little while. Um, and work's been going on in the kitchen. So the kitchen is not completely out of bounds in that we can still get water and we can wash up. But other than that, it is out of bounds because all the um, stuff's all taped up. So is the hall. But if you want to go in the hall afterwards um, with me or if John's around with John, then um, you can have a look at what's happening uh, in the building in there. Okay, please, though, parents, if children go in there, they must, must, must have parents with them. There are all sorts of reasons for that, which I won't go into. Otherwise, children might think, oh, is this the bit that Alistair said I shouldn't touch? <laughs> okay. And the route to the toilets is, again, out of the back door as normal. Uh, it isn't raining just now. We do have the accessible toilet that is available. Please use that. Just take care as you walk, uh, walk round uh, to, to that. If you don't want to come forward and through, you can actually get round the side as well if you're careful um, uh, under the scaffold. Okay. Uh, any other questions that anyone has about that or anything that I've missed? Yes, Jill. You can indeed. Okay, so you're meeting at 33 Netherhall Drive tomorrow, whereas 11.45. Okay, did you get that? Okay, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read from the Bible, from Hebrews chapter 11. Don't bother turning to it. It's only two verses. You'll, you'll know them. Many of you will be familiar with these verses. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And as we start, we're going to sing a song about faith. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. Comes from those verses at the start of Hebrews. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. So if you're able to stand, please do. We'll sing, by faith we see the hand of God. Oh, 
Father, we do thank you for the words of that song. We thank you for faith. Lord, we recognize that we rely on you for our faith. It's not something we build up for ourselves. It's not something in that sense that we, we choose to do ourselves, but you give us that faith. Lord, I just think of the, um, uh, the man who said to the Lord Jesus that he did believe, but he needed help to overcome his unbelief. And Lord, that's true for so many of us. Lord, we do pray that you'd be with us today. We pray, Lord, that you would build our faith. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would work in our hearts from the youngest to the oldest. We do ask that we would understand more about you and we would meet with you this morning, wherever we are now, whatever we're feeling, whatever our circumstances, Lord, that we would meet with you and that you would minister to our hearts, to our souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Handing over to somebody, I have Shipway written down on my piece of paper. And this is a little bit unusual. We normally have an all-age talk now. We now have all-age presentations. Colin. Uh, yes, it, it's uh, that uh, time of the year when uh, schools go back. Isn't it great, that time? <laughs> we love it when schools go back. Yes, and, uh, and all new things start happening and things change a bit. So uh, part of what I'm going to say uh, now is for the children, but don't worry if you don't remember it all, and part of it is for you as you pray for us uh, in the uh, stuff we do, particularly on uh, Sunday mornings. Um, so uh, in a few minutes we will... Uh, be giving out some books, uh, mainly as, as thanks for the children uh, for coming along and joining with us. But uh, inevitably, as years go on, things change a little bit. And because we've got building work out the back there, again, for uh, other things change. So, uh, very briefly, uh, if you can uh, understand, understand school years, uh, those children who are up to and including year five... Uh, are still in what we call Sunday Club. 
uh, instead of meeting in the hall, we're actually going to be in the middle room uh, because the hall is a mess. Um, but we'll be going back to the hall later on. For those children who are slightly older, what we've called uh, Sunday Club Plus uh, for a few years, uh, yeah, they will be meeting again. Um, but instead of meeting in the middle room, they'll be in the top room, uh, which has all been laid out very nicely for that. But um, as uh, children get older by about a year every year, um, there's um, some of those uh, who have been in Sunday Club Plus um, are thinking, right, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's getting, uh, you know, I need something a bit more. So we're trying something slightly new. Um, and so please bear with us in this one here. Uh, those uh, who are sort of middle, older teenagers will actually be staying in the uh, service, but instead of staying with their boring parents, they're going to go up into the balcony, uh, and there's, uh, they're going to have sheets that will help them make notes about what's going on during the service. Um, today, and for today only, Jill Graham, who's waving a hand there, uh, will just give you a bit of an introduction, so we'll all go out after this, uh, and then, uh, but if you see a, a load of uh, teenagers up there, uh, you think uh, they're obviously trying to keep John happy. Um, or something like that. Um, so that's what we'll be doing uh, initially, and hopefully that will go well. Um, but we are going to, uh, as we usually do, uh, give out uh, books for um, people. I'm going to wander over here and see if I can find some books. Um, a pile of books. Look at that. We have a pile of books, and if uh, children would like to uh, come up and collect these, hopefully there's a notice in there. Olivia. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Olivia. Yeah. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> she looks at me like I'm uh, rather strange. Uh, then uh, for uh, the other ones there, this is for Eloise. Eloise. Uh, next one, that's uh, Louis. Is somebody going to come up and, uh, and pick it up for? Yeah, yeah. This is not Louis, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. If you can pass that on to him, that would be great. Um, next one here is for Reuben. Uh, this is Reuben. Uh, who's this going to be for? This is for Heidi. Who's over there? Um, next one here, this is from Max. <laughs> um, and I hope this is, yes, this is Maddie. Maddie John. So, uh, so those uh, are the children who are in Sunday Club. I'm going to wonder, uh, Jen is going to come up and uh, got some more books. They can be changed. They can be changed. If you've already got that book, they can be changed. So uh, there are a couple of people who have moved, who are moving on from Sunday Club to Sunday Club Plus. And when they do that, we give them a copy of this Bible. So um, that is... Ruby, but she's not here. Does someone want to come and collect it for little? <laughs> and um, the other one is for Isabel. So we're, um, we're really looking forward to you, to, to Ruby. We're really looking forward to uh, Ruby and Isabel moving up to our group. So then these are those who've been in Sunday Club Plus. So um, Ellie, who's not Ellie, who's not here, but yes, if Ruby, this Ruby wants to collect Ellie's. <laughs> Back again in a minute. Okay, um, Abby. Uh, Ruby, this is really for you, Ruby. <laughs> And Ella. Thank you. 
Um, Daniel, where's Daniel? <laughs> and this is for Skylar. Uh, Ailey, who is not here. Do you want to <laughs> And this one is for Ethan. <laughs> um, yeah, as um, was said before, if they've got the book already or they don't like it or you don't think it's age appropriate or whatever, then um, we can easily change it. So do let us know. Okay. Um, uh, I quite often explain who's involved in the children's work. Uh, rather than do that, uh, I'll put something in the next issue of, of QB News so that uh, you've got an outline as to who's uh, involved in that work there. Uh, I say work, it's not work, it's fun. Uh, it really is. Um, so uh, we'll just say a prayer now uh, for all the children and for the helpers uh, as they, uh, as they uh, teach uh, people about God. Dear Lord God, we do thank you for uh, the children and teenagers who uh, we have here. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to speak to them, and we pray that in the coming year, each of them will grow deeper in their faith of you. Amen. Now, uh, there, uh, we're going to have a song before uh, the children go out, um, and this is a song that we did at the Holiday Club Day um, a few weeks ago. Um, it's, uh, and you know this one here. Uh, it's called uh, God Never Says Oops. Uh, and uh, you can do some actions if you want to. Uh, the, the main action, uh, you will hear the phrase, oops, God never says oops, um, uh, many times throughout the song. And the challenge that Tiffany, who was teaching it uh, to us, is that each time you've got to think of a different expression for when you've done something wrong. God never says oops or oops or oops, something like that. Uh, we will be playing to a backing track, uh, but Jean and Geraldine will uh, help lead us as well. Uh, so do uh, stand up and we will sing God Never Says Oops. Never says oops, never slips up, never makes any mistakes, no, God never says oops, cause he's got a perfect plan, how can he do it, yes he can, his promises are true, he'll always follow through, he's our creator king, he doesn't miss a thing And that's why I'm telling you God never says oops Never slips up Never makes any mistakes No, God never says oops Cause he's got a perfect plan Or oh, can he do it? Yes he can He's shepherd of the sheep He'll never fall asleep Remember little lamb He's God and not a man I'm telling you all right now yeah. God never says oops Never slips up Never makes any mistakes No, God never says oops Cause he's got a perfect plan Oh, can I do it? Yes, he can said oops right there Oops, never 
never slips up and never makes any mistakes. No, God never says oops, cause he's got a perfect plan. Oh, can he do it? Yes, he can. Oh, can he do it? Yes, he can. Oh, can he do it? Yes, he can. Whoever was, whoever was saying oops. Right, children and young people, now is the time. And if, this week at least, if you all go out of that door, and then you'll find out where, where to go. Have fun. coming as well dad well done let's just uh, let's just pray for them as they've gone heavenly father we do thank you for our children and young people we thank you for the lord jesus who when the disciples said, send them away because they're not important. We're more important than they are. Thank you for Christ's words. Of course they're important. Of course they are. Not only that, but there's a sense in which all of us need to become like little children and accept the Lord Jesus Christ with that sort of wholehearted faith that children have, almost by just being children. Heavenly Father, we do pray for them and pray for them as they change to a different group for many of them, or different leader, different things happening, Lord. Just pray that you be with them. Help those leaders to be speaking the truth to them. Help them, Lord, to share that truth with these young people. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read um, from the scriptures, from Hebrews, chapter 12. Sorry, chapter 11. Chapter 11. If you have a Bible that's in the chairs here, it's on page 1209, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Hebrews 11, verse 17, 1209. It follows on from the first two verses I read, two or three verses I read at the start of the service. <clears throat> verse 17, by faith, Abraham... When God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them had received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, would they be made perfect? Amen. We're going to sing um, a couple of songs and then have a time of prayer before we hand over to, uh, to David for the rest of the service. These two songs are very much about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, lover of my soul, all consuming fire is in your gaze. And then Jesus, be the center, be my source, be my light, Jesus. And we're going to sing the two uh, one after the other. Um, I'll probably pray something in, in between. If you'd like to stand, that's fine. If you prefer to sit, then that's fine too. We'll start off with Jesus, lover of my soul.
things my way. You alone are God, and I surrender to your ways. Jesus, be the center. indeed that the Lord Jesus Christ would be the center of our hearts this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'd meet with each one of us. May that be true for each one. In his name. Amen. Do sit down. <clears throat> just want to bring some uh, prayers. Um, praying for the world, praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, praying for the work we're doing here, the building, praying for the church and the church people as well. An announcement linked to that. Um, Pete isn't very well. Pete is in hospital. Pete and Hannah's Pete, that is. Um, so I will pray for Pete um, and Hannah's um, said that she's happy for me to share something just generally about that. So do pray for Pete and Hannah. Um, the children obviously were here. Uh, Norma is visiting with Hannah this morning. Um, he has probably has atrial fib fibrillation, if that means anything to any of you. Um, so let's remember them in prayer, as I will pray. But if you can remember them in your own prayers as well, that would be really good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we started the service thinking about creation. Thinking about the fact that we understand that the universe was formed at your command. And we understand that through faith. Lord, we thank you for the faith to understand something of your works. We thank you for our world. Lord, we've messed it up in so many ways. But Lord, we thank you for the world that you've given us. Lord, we do pray for that world. We pray for physically for the world. We pray for efforts to think more carefully about what we do, to be better stewards of the world. But Lord, we recognize too that this world is temporary, that this world will come to an end. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, help us to be good stewards of that which you've given us as we look forward to that which will be renewed, that, that which will be totally new. Oh Lord, as we look forward to that, we pray that you would encourage us. Lord, we do pray for our world in a, 
in the sense of politics, in the sense of nations, in the sense of people. Lord, we pray for those nations that are at war. So many of those wars are unjust wars. I'm not even sure in myself really what makes a righteous war anymore. It doesn't seem uh, possible in, in that sense. But Lord, we do pray for those people who are suffering across the world. Lord, we pray for peace. We recognize that in, in another way, wars are part of the end times and part of the signs of the end times. And, and Lord, we recognize that. We do pray, that, Lord Jesus, that you would come and that you would come soon. But Lord, in the meantime, we pray for those who are suffering. And we pray for justice. And we pray for peace. We pray too, Lord, for those, whether it's through human action or whether it's through what are so-called natural disasters, Lord, those that are suffering, those that don't have enough food, that don't have enough water, we pray for them too. We pray for governments and leaders that they would make wise decisions. We pray against corruption. We pray against those people who would turn these things into some sort of weapon, Lord. We just lift up people who are struggling across the world. And Lord, even more closer at home in this country and in Europe, there are so many difficulties and so many challenges. Lord, it can be really depressing just listening to the news. We do lift up our country. We pray for our king. We pray for the royal family. We pray for the prime minister and the government. We pray for parliament. Lord, thank you for the democracy that we decry and deride so easily. And yet, Lord, it's so much better than the situation in so many countries. We do pray for wisdom. We do pray that they would make good decisions. We pray, Lord, for those Christians in the government and in parliament, that they would stand true to your word. And, Lord, that through them, that you might influence the, the direction of this country. And Lord, we pray for our area, we pray for this village and the town of Loughborough and the other villages around where, where all, most of us live, Lord. We, we just lift them up to you. We lift our neighbours to you. And we pray, Lord, for them. We pray uh, for good health for them. We pray, Lord, that they would want to turn to you. We pray that they would open their eyes and realise their need of you. And Lord, we pray for the work of this church in that and the other churches around as they seek to share you as individuals and as groups and as a church, both in the church building and outside the church building, Lord. We pray for your gospel, that it would go out and that people would listen, that you'd give them ears to hear. And so, Lord, we pray for our church here. We pray for Ian and Mandy. We thank you for them. Thank you for this holiday they're having with the rest of their family. And Lord, pray that they would have a restful time, a peaceful time, an enjoyable time. We pray that they would come back refreshed and we thank you for Ian. We pray that he would remain as a man of God who believes your word and believes that your word has things to say to us today. Lord, thank you for that privilege. We know that's not the case in every church in our land. We pray, Lord, that you'd keep him safe, you'd protect him from the attacks of the evil one. We pray for our leaders here, the, the deacons and others who take responsibility in all sorts of different ways. Lord, we lift them to you. We pray for our church in the sense of our buildings, and Lord, as we, in, in a sense, suffer through not being able to get into cupboards or having dust in our drinks or um, the floors being dirty or whatever, Lord, we thank you um, for the builders. We thank you for Mayway as a company. We thank you that as a company they honor you. And Lord, we pray for each person involved in that work. And Lord, we pray for patience as, as we continue with uh, uh, the things that we do as a church. For those other groups that join, particularly the beavers and the, the rangers and others that come and use the buildings, Lord, we pray that you would keep us safe and you'd help us to continue with our work. But Lord, we recognize most especially that the church is not this building. The church is a gathering, a local gathering of your body on earth the Christians on earth. And Lord, we do pray as we continue as church that you'd help us to lift each other up, to pray for each other, to support each other, and to reach out together into this world. Particularly, Lord, I'd like to pray for those who are struggling at the moment. Lord, there are a number of our fellowship who are grieving. 
There are a number who are not well, a number of suffering in different ways, Lord, whether that's physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, Lord, we lift them up to you. But I'd like to pray especially for Pete this morning. We thank you, Lord, that he is in the right place. He's in hospital and is having tests. Lord, we pray for wisdom for those that will do those tests and those that will make decisions. We pray for Hannah. We pray um, uh, for Norma and John and uh, Colin and Alison too, Lord, as, as grandparents, other members of the family, and for the three children here. We just pray, Lord, that you'd give them all peace. We think of the words of that song, God never says oops. Lord, we just pray <clears throat> that you would give us strength to trust you in these difficult circumstances and any other difficult circumstances that we face. We lift ourselves to you. And we pray now as we continue with this service, as David comes and we sing again and then he brings your word to us, we pray that you'd give him the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, we pray that we, you'd give us ears to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you for your welcome here uh, this morning. It's really good to be here with you. Uh, I've visited on occasions in the past over many years, uh, but it's uh, a great joy and a privilege to be able to come and share uh, God's word uh, this morning. We're going to read again from Hebrews chapter 12. The reading in chapter 11 was really by way of introduction into chapter 12, these first three verses, uh, which are the verses that we're going to consider together this morning. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such contradiction or such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I've slipped automatically into the authorised version for a moment. Contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. They're the verses we're going to consider shortly, uh, but let's uh, sing uh, again together. We're going to sing God of Grace, Amazing Wonder. I think you have sung it before, uh, but not often, so we'll listen to the tune all the way through first before we sing, stand and sing together.
I want us to gather this morning to think about these three, uh, first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, I think they're fairly straightforward, and, um, uh, but yeah, I think they're a great encouragement and a great blessing uh, to us. And very simply, they're all about Jesus, and they're all about Jesus. And Jesus is the one who is the center of everything. I think we sang about him being the center in one of the songs that we, we sang. But he's the center of time. He's the one who's divided time in two. The year is 2024, 2024, 2024 years since what? He's the center of the church. He's the only reason why there is a church across the world. A body of people, people who are trusting in Christ and enjoying him. And uh, uh, knowing him. He's the center of the universe. He's the one who has made all things and created all things. And now is the one who continues to sustain the universe, this vast universe, and to rule over all things. And he's the center of eternity too. And there's a day coming when in eternity every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is the Lord. Throughout the New Testament, there's many pictures of the Christian. Maybe you can think of some of them uh, depicted as a, a pilgrim on a journey, a soldier in a battle, a, a farm worker sowing and reaping, a laborer building, constructing a building. Many different pictures of the Christian in the New Testament. And here in this passage, as, as elsewhere, we have another picture of the Christian, the Christian as an athlete. It's a common theme and uh, I think very uh, pertinent in an Olympic year and with the uh, final day of the Paralympics uh, today, the picture of the athlete and time and time it comes again through the New Testament and Paul and others often refer to it. In Acts chapter 20, Paul speech speaks of finishing the race and completing the task given to him. In 1 Corinthians 9, he, speaks that, he says that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. In other words, he's saying, do your best. Give it everything you can. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, you can't win unless you keep the rules. It reminds me of uh, uh, an ultramarathon runner. Do you know the ultramarathon the marathon's 26 miles, that's bad enough. The ultramarathon could be a 50. Uh, I have a friend who's done ultramarathons, he's done the long one, Hardmore's, 200 miles. Um, but this ultramarathon runner, uh, there was a, a, an article, this ultramarathon runner got banned for 12 months because pathway around the 50 mile course, she got a lift in a car from someone else. Uh, but we're to run, uh, Paul says, you can't win unless you keep the rules. And I suppose my question for all of us this morning would be, how are we doing? How are we doing in the race? We're told to run with perseverance the race marked out uh, for us. H how are we doing? How are we getting on? Are we persevering? Are we doing well? Are we lagging behind? Maybe you feel that you've ground to a halt. And it's possible that there's someone here this morning and you just think, well, actually, I've never started on that race. I'm not a Christian. I'm not trusting in Christ alone for salvation. We need to follow the examples of the athletes. We need to do these things which Paul speaks about. We need to finish the race. We need to do our best. We need to stick to the rules. We need to keep persevering. I love this uh, book of Hebrews, and um, I've just been thinking about it and listening to one or two sermons and reading it recently. In the past, I've thought about preaching a whole series of sermons through it, and I, I didn't do it. I'm wondering it again. I just need to get down and prepare. I need to persevere and do it. But it's a book that is full of Jesus. Yes, there's all sorts of... Uh, uh, difficult things in there, um, but it is a book which is full of Jesus. Listen to how it starts. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. 
But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And it goes on. It's a a wonderful book, and it's a book which is all about Jesus. It is a book which is full of warnings as well, uh, but it's a book that is full of exhortations. And there's warnings about drifting and doubting, even unbelief. And it's written to people who are in danger of, of, of going back to their old way of things. If we think of the Jews and many of them with their um, ordinances which they kept and the temple and all of those things. And some of them were in, in danger of going back to their Judaism. And it has something to say to us today. We're in danger of going back to our old way of life and not pursuing Jesus. Listen to how chapter 2 starts. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. We must pay more careful attention. It reminds me of some of my old school reports, um, and maybe you know that as well. We must pay more uh, careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we don't drift and drift away. It is a book that is full of warnings, but it is a book which is, I think, very positive and encouraging because it's a book full of exhortations. Uh, I have a, 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 a friend, uh, his, his father was one of the elders back in Melbourne Hall where we used to be many years ago, and I remember um, Cliff Harris speaking on this uh, Hebrews, and I can't remember if it was Hebrews or 11 or what, but he said the book of Hebrews is like a, great, a green grocer's. Do you remember the green grocers full of vegetables? He said, it's like a green gro- grocers. It's full of lettuces. Um, and he went on, let us. That phrase comes 14 times through the book. Let us be careful. We have one there in chapter 2. Let us draw near. Let us hold firmly. Let us approach the throne of grace. It's a book of exhortations to go on. It's a book that tells us that Jesus is so much better. And that phrase comes 12 times in the book. It speaks of better things. It speaks of a better hope. It speaks of better promises. It speaks of a better country. All rooted in Jesus. So I want us together to think about these first few verses, which very clearly point us to Jesus. And chapter 12 begins by pointing us Uh, Back a chapter, chapter 11. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And this chapter 11 is this great cloud of witnesses. It's worth reading, and it's worth reading again. Throughout this uh, this week, I've read a little bit of it and worked my way through the chapter. um, And it's full of faith. We sometimes think of faith being something which is given to us. But actually, faith is spoken of as something that we are to do. Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, by faith, they did these things. It's full of faith, and it's full of commendations as well. We didn't read the earlier verses, but a number of them, um, uh, it mentions that they were commended for their faith. So these people in chapter 11, they lived by faith. And then verse 30 tells us they were all commended for their faith. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and it goes on, but but why are they here? Why why, why is there this chapter 11, this great cloud of witnesses? I used to think, and I've heard it said, and you've probably heard it said as well, I suspect, because it's an illustration that's often used, that this great cloud of witnesses, it sort of looks back to the Olympic Games and at the old Olympics, the medal winners, the people who'd won before, would be there at the finishing line, over the finishing line, looking down, urging those on in the race to get to the end. 
But I'm not sure that is quite right. There may be something of that, but I'm not sure it's quite right. On a Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock, I like to go to the pool in Loughborough. I like to swim. I used to be a swimmer, still pretend to be a swimmer. Um, but I like to swim. Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock, we arrive at the pool, and the British swimmers there, the British swimming squad, are just getting out at 11 o'clock. There's a, a number of Olympians. Um, there's gold medal winners from this year. There's Adam Peaty there getting out of the pool. And um, I can assure you that they don't get out of the pool and then sit on the side and watch us. We get down there early to sit on the side and watch them and to be inspired by them. And think if they can do it, we can do it. And then we get in the pool and pretend that we can. But do you see my point? They're there to encourage us. They're there as an example to us. The example is, if they can do it, so can we. That's not quite like that in the pool. If they can do it, we know that we can't. But here, if they can do it, if they can trust God, if they can have faith, if they can be commended for their faith, so too can we. They're examples. They're here to encourage us. They're here to, to help us to run well. They're here to help us to keep going. And I want us together to think about four things from these for, uh, few verses. Four things to help us to run well. Four things to help us to keep going. And uh, I put them there in the sheet. I haven't given too much away, so you'll have to pay attention and listen carefully. Um, and they are the stuff, the sin, the race, and the focus. The stuff, the sin, the race, and the focus. And if you read the verses, you'll probably work them out for yourself. But firstly, we need to remove the stuff that slows us down. Let us throw off everything that hinders. We need to remove the stuff that slows us down. When Adam Peaty comes out onto the poolside, and when the swimmers stand up on the blocks to run their race, they don't stand up in big baggy shorts, Bermuda swimming trunks that some of us might uh, here, where? When the athletes come out on the track to run the 100 metres, they lay aside their track suits. They take them off. They don't have to. Well, maybe the rules say that they do. Uh, they don't have to, but they do. I think we're probably all familiar with decluttering. Do you ever have a declutter? Yes, a few nods. I can see that, and I know at times we have boxes there of things ready to go. And it's, it's good to declutter. Maybe you follow the 12, 12, 12 rule. Throw away 12 things, donate 12 things, and return 12 things to their proper homes. And uh, there's another and other methods of decluttering. But, but we need to declutter. We need to take stock of our lives. And I think it's something we need to regularly do. And we need to make sure that we remove the stuff that slows us down from living for Christ. And these things can be allowable things and innocent things. They can even be praiseworthy things. But they can get in the way of us living for Christ. It might be what we watch or look at. Beware of the endless scroll. Do you know the endless scroll on your phone in Google? And uh, something appears and you think, oh, and something else appears. It's endless. It goes on forever. On my phone, I turn off discovery so that it won't do that. But so many things give you that endless scroll and can be a distraction, can be stuff that slows us down. It might even be the stuff that we've got. It might be our possessions and our gadgets and our homes and all of these things. Now, they're not wrong things, but they can get in the way of running the race set before us. It could be our careers. It's right that we're diligent in our work, but it's possible to pursue our careers more than we pursue Jesus, of them to slow us down. It could be retirement, thinking, well, I've done that now and I'm going to live my life of ease. It can even be, I've got my notes here, 
uh, it's a danger for me sometimes, can even be a love of theology, trying to grapple with things. What's right? Does the Bible really say that? What does it mean by that? It could be a love of doctrine and truth above a love of Jesus. We need to throw off or remove the stuff that slows us down. So that's firstly. Secondly, we need to throw off the sin that entangles us. The verse says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You know what it is when something gets entangled, whether it be getting the Christmas lights out of the box whether it be that rope in the garage that you want to use for something and tie something down, whether it be the cables in the home, things entangle. I remember many years ago as a young child, I had this uh, lovely sort of uh, magenta-colored bike. And I used to zoom around on that little tiny bike in the days when we were let loose out of the home. And I had a skipping rope as well, because I like to skip occasionally. And one day I decided to combine the two. So I hang the uh, skipping rope over the handlebars and off I went. And you know what's coming. They uh, had those little wooden handles on, swung in through the wheels, wheels locked up, and I came flying off. And you say, how stupid can you get? But our sin entangles us. It might not be a skipping rope on the handlebar, but think about the runner. It could be his shoelace undone and his shoes not properly secured. Does it matter? Yes, it does. We need to throw off the sin that entangles. There could be big sins, but there might be small sins. There might be obvious sins, but there might be subtle ones that we were aware of that we just try and hide. But they can bring us down in a moment. And it's a slippery path to allow sin to remain. Is there some sin entangling us today? It could be our actions. It could be the things that we're doing. The things that we're watching. The places we're going. The ways we're behaving. I suspect for many of us it's more like to be our attitudes. Pursuit of pleasure. Desire for power or control. Envy. Bitterness. Pride. We need to throw it off. We need to pray that God would search our hearts and show us if there be some way which is wrong within us. Allow him to put his finger upon the sin in our lives. And then we need to acknowledge it and confess it. And thank Jesus that he bore it on the cross, that he took the punishment for it, that we might be forgiven. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. It can be taken from us and placed on him when we repent and believe. We need to remove the stuff that slows us down. We need to throw off the sin that entangles. And then thirdly, in the next verse, or the same verse, uh, we need to run the race before us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily tangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I wonder what you think the race is. Is it, uh, is it a sprint? Is it a marathon? Is it an ultra marathon? I wonder if it's a bit more like the steeplechase. Do you know the steeplechase? Seven and a half times round the track, 3,000 metres, 28 barriers, seven water jumps. You never quite know what's coming next. I wonder if it's a bit more uh, like that. But the race isn't the same for us all. It varies. It's different. Did you notice those two words, for us? Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Some will be long, some will be short, some will be easier, some will be harder. But we're called by God's word to run with patience and perseverance, the race marked out for us. And we need to watch out for distractions a long way. If we can come to a, a, another event in the Olympics, the hurdles. Do you like that one? When they run along the track and it goes over all of those hurdles 
But don't be distracted by looking at someone else's hurdles. Don't be distracted by looking at, you know, you're going along the race and you're looking over and think, wait a minute, those hurdles are lower than mine. Wait a minute, those, those hurdles are further apart than mine. He hasn't got as many as I have. We need to beware of being distracted by uh, other people's hurdles. We need to beware of what I call the it's not fair syndrome. My children would always tell me off. Uh, uh, we, we, we tell them, you know, they, they say it's not fair and my response to that is no, life isn't fair. And that is the reality of it. Our races are different and we need to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Remembering that his grace is sufficient for whatever I need and whatever our race is. He will give me the grace that I need to run the race marked out for me and he will do the same for you because his grace is sufficient for every need. So don't spend your time looking at other people's hurdles but don't spend your time looking at your own hurdles as well. From what I understand, the hurdlers, they have to look where they're going and not stop and look down at the hurdles all the time lest they trip. And it's possible to be so focused on the hurdles that you get distracted, and I think that's when things start to go wrong. I think of uh, Peter. In, um, do you remember that strange incident um, when Peter is walking on the water? It's, a, it's an interesting one. Uh, Jesus uh, comes walking on the water to the disciples in the boat with the wind and the waves and the storm, and uh, they, they see, oh, you know, there's Jesus coming, or they think it is. And Peter says to Jesus, uh, shouts to him, if it's you, Lord, tell me to get out of the boat and walk to you. I always think that's a, a bit of a strange request. I've got my views on why, what I think might be going on there, but uh, that's for another day. But that's what he says. And Jesus says, yes, it's me. And he tells Peter to get out of the boat and to start walking. And Peter does. And you can imagine that moment as he steps out onto the boat. No, steps out from the boat onto the water and starts to walk towards Jesus. But then the wind blows. And he hears it and he looks. And he looks down and he sees the waves. And he starts to sink. Things start to go wrong. When he took his eyes off Jesus, that's when things started to go wrong. So we need to run the race before us that God has given to us, whatever that might be. And really what happens with Peter is uh, leads us nicely into uh, the, 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 fourth, um, uh, the fourth thing for us. Uh, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We might just think it's just too difficult. My race is too difficult. You don't know what I've got to go through. Through you don't. You haven't experienced the things that I've experienced. Experienced. It, it's just too hard. It might just be you're apprehensive as we face another week. Maybe a bit fearful of what might happen. Worried about how things might go. Anticipating an appointment which you don't know what the outcome will be. We need. To keep our eyes on Jesus. And that's what verse 2 says. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him. Endured the cross. Scorning its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. So that you will not grow weary. And lose heart. This is the Jesus of the Bible. This is the Jesus of of the big book of Hebrews. This is a, he is the one who is so much better than everything else. He's the one who can keep us going when things around us are going wrong. Let me finish with four things about Jesus that we see in these verses. Four things about Jesus. Firstly, he's the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one who changes us and continues to change, change us. Jesus is the one who will bring us safely home. 
to be with him in heaven if we're trusting in Christ. And it's all accomplished by, by his authorship, not our achievements. That doesn't mean we sit back and do nothing. We need to beware of thinking, well, he's done it all, I don't need to do anything. Because remember what the first verse says, it tells us to throw off the things that hinder us and the sin that entangles us. So we are called to respond. We are called to do something. But Jesus is the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith. Second thing about Jesus, he shows us that suffering and rejoicing are friends. Did you notice what it says in verse 2? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. It's a common theme in the New Testament, this idea of suffering and joy. They're never far from each other. The two do go together. And actually it seems that that's what the Christian life is to be. And the greatest example of suffering and joy going together is in Jesus at the cross. And it refers to it here, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Suffering and rejoicing are friends. And Jesus understands. He understands the struggles and the suffering and the pain. Hebrews 4 speaks about Jesus being our high priest, the one who sympathizes with us in our weakness. And that's a wonderful thought. He sympathizes with us in our weakness, in our sufferings, in our difficulties. He is with us. And actually, I think, I think my experience has been, I've probably known more of his joy when things have been harder. That seems to be the reality, but suffering and rejoicing are friends. The Bible doesn't promise us exemption from difficulties and trials, but it does promise that Jesus will be with us. And it does promise joy. Romans 14, it speaks about the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. These are the blessings that we have in Jesus, and he shows us that suffering and rejoicing our friends. Thirdly, about Jesus, he's seated at the right hand of God. That's what it tells us. Um, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The right hand of God is a favoured position, a position of blessing, a position of strength, a position of authority. And he sits down not out of exhaustion, but out of completion. I remember being cycling one uh, sometime last year, I think it might have been, with uh, Alistair and Colin, and uh, Friday morning we go out for a cycle. Actually, we go out for coffee and cake. That's really why we go out. But you have to cycle to get there. And we went into, what's the cafe by the park uh, just here? And we went in there, and um, there was a man sitting on the, this big settee. There might be someone here, I don't know. Sitting on the settee. Sound out, he might have even been snoring with his newspaper at, uh, over him, one of exhaustion. But Jesus doesn't sit down out of exhaustion. He sits down out of completion. Not having a rest. But actually, the work of salvation is complete and he is continuing to do his work. That work of intercession for us on our behalf. And again, that little phrase, for us, remember I mentioned about running the race for us. That's an interesting little phrase in Hebrews. I think it comes six times. But in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, it says that he, Jesus, is appearing in God's presence for us. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That this morning, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God for us. On behalf of us. In God's presence, the enthroned Lord. So thirdly, Jesus, remember that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And then finally, remember that Jesus is the one who will keep you from growing weary and losing heart. Verse 3, 
Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's a wonderful phrase, not growing weary and losing heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul's writing to the church there. And at the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter, he says, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. He speaks of outwardly we're wasting away. And many of us know what it is to feel that. Outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly being renewed day by day. And that is the wonder of the gospel. That is the wonder of faith in Christ and trusting him. Is that although we're very aware that in our bodies we're wasting away, day by day we're being renewed and we can be renewed. And Jesus by his spirit, reaches that part of us that nothing else can reach. A swim in the pool, a ride on the bike, some exercise can do us some good, but Jesus reaches that part that nothing else can reach by the work of his spirit. He can keep us from growing weary and losing heart. As we, as we look to Jesus, as we as we read about him in his word, as we meditate on what he is like, as we spend time with him in communion with him, reaching that part that nothing else can reach. Keep going. We have everything we need in the race. And just remember that often the end of the race is the hardest. I know that from the racing I still try and do in the pool on occasions. It seems to get harder not easier. If you've been watching the Olympics, you see them, you get to that final lap on the track and uh, you see some of them just, just run out of steam. There's nothing left. They try for that sprint to the line and some do it, but others, they don't. Well, they make it to the line, but they fade away. I remember uh, years ago, I was at the Beach Mission reunion. I've been involved with the work of United Beach Missions for many years. And... Uh, Professor Werner Wright, who was one of the founder members of Beach Missions, was being interviewed. He had been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and he knew that he didn't have long to live, and he was being interviewed. And um, uh, just about the work of Beach Missions and about his life, and uh, Gerard, who was interviewing, said to him, he said, he said, very often, people in your situation, when they know they're, you know, when the end is near, they, they sit down, they slow down, they just relax a bit. And Werner said this, he says, when you see the finishing tape, you run all the more harder. And that's what Werner did right to the end, all that he could to live for Jesus, to follow Jesus. May God help each one of us, whatever our circumstances, whatever our race, to keep going and to keep looking to Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. Let's sing our final song together. And again, it's singing of Jesus. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
Do sit down and we'll pray. Father, we do thank you for the privilege we have of meeting together this morning. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, a wonderful saviour, the one who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Father, we're very aware this morning of the uh, races set before us are very different. And Father, we thank you that you know and that you understand and that you are with us, and that the Lord Jesus has gone before us. Father, we pray that you would help us to keep our eyes upon him, looking to Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. <laughs>